Since the time of the first cities of ancient Mesopotamia, industry was composed entirely of small shops with people crafting items by hand. A day's work might result in the casting of one spoon, sometimes three. Compared to a modern mass production factory, working by hand is slow but much more personal. It was this way in the U.S. up until the early 1800s. Tunis explains that there were four kinds of shops. There were craftspeople who did custom work to order in what was called bespoke work, as we see here. Retailers were people who simply bought and sold goods. Other artisans made items which they sold on a take-it-or-leave-it basis. And fourth, there were specialists who performed some direct service for people, tailoring or the people who traveled the country offering to repair shoes or metal pans or some other specific object who we met earlier. These travelers did most of their work during April through October when the roads were least miserable. The city had many shopless hawkers shouting their offer of goods or services as they walked the streets, sometimes pushing a cart full of goods, sometimes using a dog to pull a cart. They sold wood, charcoal, brooms, chimney sweeping, sharpened scissors, and sold meat, fish, game, and milk. The milk seller carried milk through the streets in big copper cans and ladled it into the customer's container right at their front door. Tunis describes the old joke about a hard of hearing person sticking a trumpet through a barely open door and getting milk in it. They also bought rags to be used in making paper. Paper was first made in China around the year 100 AD. Here is the first printed book which was made in China in the year 868 AD and the first paper money which was printed in China around the year 960 AD. Shops used paintings or three-dimensional objects to depict the shop's business to customers even to the 30 percent of us who were illiterate. For example, a dentist shop might hang a two-shaped model. Some shops illegally displayed the heraldic arms of English trade guilds, such as this one from the Baker's Guild, though few persons recognize these now foreign symbols. A tavern sign was either a jug or a portrait of a presumably important person. Tuna says that in 1776 every King George Tavern changed its name but not its portrait. Tobacco shops customarily hung a picture of an Indian supposedly because Indians had to introduce tobacco to the Europeans. One tobacco shop in Baltimore in 1775 had an old ship mask carved into the figure of a standing Indian, and by 1850 every tobacco shop had a similar figure standing at its entrance. Shops and homes did not have numbered addresses. People would tell guests coming from out of town to go to the inn on River Street and ask anyone you see to point out my house. Every shop was run by its owner, who might also have an employee or an apprentice. It was rare for a shop to have more than a few workers. As we saw from medieval Europe, the shop was a room within a home that simultaneously served as living quarters, workshop, inventory warehouse, and retail showroom. The shop owner obtained materials discussed custom jobs with customers and directed apprentices. Shop owners and their spouses did the retailing and accepted payment in most any form, often farm products. A shop in a city might advertise that this country pay was accepted. A silversmith's newspaper ad might also mention some cheese he or she had to sell. If coins were exchanged, they were usually Spanish dollars. These were cut into eight bits or pieces. Two bits made a quarter dollar, hence the term. Each shop services those people living within a day's walk, which is 10 miles or 16 kilometers. Each shop competes to provide the most goods and services for the least price and typically makes a 12% profit. When a customer walks 10 miles to the shop to, to negotiate and conduct business,
then the shop's family might feed and even house that customer. This was the world of Adam Smith's invisible hand. A craftsperson was not as specialized as today. For example, a printer was an editor, typesetter, book binder, book publisher, and book seller. The printer repaired books by reselling covers and usually printed the local newspaper. A printing shop also sold writing paper, ruled paper, whose rulings were hand-drawn in the shop for keeping accounting records. They sold pen quills, ink, and the wax used to seal folded papers for privacy and correspondence. A printing shop often made its own ink from either foreign or local organic materials. Some printers made a surplus of ink to sell to others. Printing presses were expensive and finicky to operate. They are made by only a few persons, still following the Gutenberg design. The first printing press in the American continents arrived in Mexico in the 1550s, and the second in Lima, Peru in 1584. In 1638, the first press to be used in the English colonies was set up in the cellar of Harvard College. Printers published religious books, translations of Greek and Latin classics, history, school texts, official proclamations, apprenticeship contracts, and almanacs. An almanac contained weather predictions, moon phases, tides and schedules of courts, post riders, ferries, and freight wagons. When needed, space in a newspaper was filled with jokes and home remedies. Type was also expensive. It had to be imported from Europe. The typical printing shop owned one set of type and so printed in a single font. Type pieces were kept in a case having separate sections for each letter. To create a page of text, individual letters had to be placed onto a block, which would then be smeared with ink, covered with a sheet of paper, and finally pressed. Individual letters of type were, handed, were hand placed into that block at a rate of almost one per second. Tunis explains that the printer grabbed type from the case without even having to look, just as the typist today doesn't have to look at the keys. Small letters were more frequently used and so were placed in a lower case within closest reach of the typesetter. Larger letters were usually less frequently used and so were grabbed from a more distant or upper case. We still use these terms today. By the year 1900, the typical printing shop owned type for 300 different fonts. By the year 2000, a computer could hold tens of thousands of fonts. In the early colonies, paper came from Europe. A late boatload of paper might stop the presses. Later, local paper was made from cloth rags gathered from the community. The rags were chopped into pieces, wet, left to decay for a few months, and then stamped into sheets. Many processes were experimented with while trying to better refine paper. Colonists tried making paper from corn husks, straw, pine cones, seaweed, moss, or wool, but did not know enough chemistry to break down these materials. In Asia, paper has always been made from wood. This was not done in the U.S. until recently. But it's like typing. If you know what you're doing, you get quick at it. Yeah. All right. <laughs> If you are a professional typist in the year 2010, I expect you to type 85 to 90 words a minute. Yeah. If you were a type setter in 1838, I would expect you to have gone through seven years of an apprenticeship, and at the end of that time, you should be able to set a book page in one hour. There's only 1,100 characters on the average book page. A newspaper typically contained four pages and was shared around the community until it was worn out. It contained literary works, local commentaries, three-month-old news stories from foreign exchanges, articles reprinted from newspapers of other colonies, and two pages of local ads. As newspapers were taken to other colonies, news was being shared. Using nothing but our animal mind, we human beings have solved every problem that has come our way. The proof is that we are still here but solutions are typically found after some fumbling in the dark. Notice also that a solution never precedes the problem and that problems 
further evolve with each generation. The techniques of our ancestors show that they were very clever in solving the problems of their generation. We sometimes have trouble understanding that a group of people will not solve a problem before it has come their way. That's why some of us human beings continue to live as gatherer hunters and have not yet switched to so-called modern ways. Not one problem has come along to cause us to adapt our well-working ways. It is not the case that every gatherer hunter wants to drop their well-working ways to be just like an American. The techniques and procedures of our civilization are the combined sum of the solutions obtained by all of the persons throughout the planet and throughout all previous generations. Once a technique or procedure has been developed, it is quickly adopted by every group of people currently experience a need for that solution, as we saw in Ralph Linton's description of the global diffusion of techniques and inventions. We'll next look at a few aspects of colonial technology and have a glimpse of their more ancient origins. For example, we were making both baskets and boats when we were still gatherer hunters, before the time of the first farming villages. Basket-making techniques have been passed from parent to offspring for thousands of years. During the early years of the U.S., whenever a basket became worn out, someone in the family might gather some material to make another. In the last century, families have forgotten how to do many such things that are now only manufactured. We have been making wooden furniture since the time of our first permanent houses. Much furniture has been found in ancient Egyptian tombs. Ship making was done in ancient times and evolved from prehistoric experience. By 1000 BC, bands of humans had migrated by boat to the most remote islands of the oceans. In the year 1774, one-third of England's merchant ships were made in the forested colonies, including the new style of fast-moving clippers that could outrun pirates but carried less cargo than did older designs. Shipmaking required many specialists, including rope makers, cell makers who made hemp or linen cells, ornamental brass makers, and carpenters who use their eyes and experience and some steam to bend wood as a ship has few straight boards. They search the forest for naturally shaped pieces of wood that would serve specific functions and they selected wood having the appropriate grain direction for specific boat parts so that that piece would best bear its expected load. Blacksmiths made iron blocks, pulleys, anchors, chain, rudder pieces, cannon, and the iron bands that were wrapped around masts. By custom, the oldest sailor would christen a newly finished ship. Since the time of the first humans, most every tool has been made from animal parts, including bones and bladders. Only in recent decades are we changing this practice. During colonial times, for example, horn and turtle shell was cut, boiled, pressed flat, and used for combs, lens holders, and snuff box tops and such. Scraps might be made into buttons. A thin slice of horn was somewhat transparent and so was used in a lanthorn, which is a lantern with windows of horn rather than expensive glass. Through the first 9,000 years of agricultural-based civilization, 
Each and every day, every family ground grain into flour in a laborious process. He saw that the ancient Mesopotamian farmers took their grain to thrashers who kept a portion for their service. About 2,000 years ago, rather than personally grinding handfuls or mill-sized amounts of grain between rocks, animals were used to pull heavy rolling stones that ground fruits or cereals by the basket load in a commercial enterprise. In another approach, the animal was moving only an upper stone that was rotated on top of a lower stationary stone. The large stones had to be chiseled and maintained. Grain was poured through a hole in the center of the upper stone. That grain moved radially outward as it was crushed between the moving stones, and the resulting flour emerged from the outer edges of the stone. In their book, Cathedral Forge and Waterfill, Francis and Joseph Guise explained that the horizontal watermill was probably invented by those of us who are living in Armenia around the year 200 BC. At about that time in China, we began using water power to rotate the upper grinding stone while the Romans began using animals for this purpose. Water mills were typically horizontal east of Persia and were vertical west of Persia. 900 years after the water wheel, in the 7th century AD, it first occurred to a person in Persia that the wind could also push a mill. The use of vertical windmills had made its way to Europe in the 12th century AD. Since the wind was caught edge on in pinwheel fashion, the entire building, or at least its roof, frequently had to be turned toward the wind. In a so-called undershot water wheel, the motion and momentum of water current is harnessed as it forces the paddle wheel to spin. The paddled wheel could also be oriented horizontally. In an overshot water wheel, water fills buckets at the top of the rotating wheel and then the weight of the water forces the wheel to rotate as the water falls. A stream is dammed to create a reservoir which is allowed to fill by night and released by day to flow over the wheel. Since overshot water wheels must support the weight of the water and require a dam and structure, they are more expensive to build than our undershot wheels. But the geese show that an overshot wheel produces about 15 times the power of an undershot wheel and about 100 times the power of an animal turned mill. The number of mills in England grew from 100 to 5600 through the years 1000 through 1086 AD as given by William the Conqueror's taxation census or doomsday book. George Dubas explains that there was one mill for every 46 peasant households and that the peasant diet was switching from boiled unground oat porridge to baked bread. A person can live off two and a half pounds or one kilogram of bread per day. About three kilograms or seven pounds of potatoes have to be eaten per day to get sufficient nutrients to remain alive. As we see a video from the Otterton Mill Living History Museum demonstrating the entire process from grain to bread, we'll discuss the medieval lord and peasant. The village lord forbid unfree peasants to grind up their own grain at home. He instead required peasants to pay to have their grain ground up at one local mill to which the lord had sold a monopoly. Each day, peasant families took their grain to the miller who ground it while the peasant waited in line. The miller then gave back their own grain in the form of flour, minus the 3% portion that was the miller's fee. Each peasant took home the same grain that he or she had brought, only it was now in the form of flour. This made some peasants mad enough to return to eating boiled porridge rather than baked bread. Peasants did not like to have their to haul their grain to the mill, nor to stand in line waiting for their turn. Even worse, landlords allowed free tenants to pay a fee to skip to the front of the line 
which predictably angered the rest of us peasants. If you come back tomorrow, we're making flour tomorrow. Hi. We're actually milling and making flour. In addition, free tenants paid only 2.5% fee. Tuna says that since the time of Chaucer, Miller's had a bad reputation because some would make a secret hole to catch extra flour for themselves. In 18th century New England, some mill owners began buying grain from farmers and selling previously sacked flour. In this case, farmers did not go home with the same grain that they had brought. There were no lords in the colonies, but farmers still showed the same sort of impatience toward anyone trying to skip to the front of the line. The miller share was now reg regulated by law, and fines were paid to the offended person when a miller was caught cheating. Milling stones began to have both large and small holes to allow both coarse and fine flour to be ground. Some persons traveled the country working as millstone sharpeners. The wheat goes in, that's the wheat that goes in. Wheat. Nothing is added, nothing is taken away. It can be cut stone ground. We have been making bread for several thousand years. This was a daily chore for most every household where grain and yeast existed. Tunis says that commercial, medieval bakers cheated so regularly that London bakers came to be required to give the baker's dozen of 13 rolls to assure customers their money's worth. The city of New Amsterdam, which was later renamed to New York City, had a bake shop by the year 1648. The mayor's monthly duties included weighing each baker's bread loaves, which were required to weigh 8 pounds or 3.5 kilograms. Today's loaves no longer weigh that much. 18th century bakers began work way before dawn and worked half-dressed because of the intense heat of the ovens. The baker needed 200 pounds or 100 kilograms of dough with strong hands cut low-sized pieces to rise, and then place them into the oven. Wood was burned in the lower fireplace, seen on the right, and dough was placed in the upper fireplace, which held no wood. The slow rate of cooking resulted in a thicker crust than we usually see today. Bakers kept their supply of yeast alive indefinitely by feeding it a paste of flour and mashed potatoes each night. The colonial baker usually obtained flour from the miller, but people sometimes brought in dough that they had prepared at home to have it baked by the baker. They might initial their dough to be assured they got back that which they had brought. A customer might choose to bring cloth in which to wrap bread carried home from the baker. Bakers did not make pies. Those were made by the pie maker, who did little else. To set the curls of a wig, sometimes a wig maker brought a wig to be baked in the baker's oven. <laughs> 